Extreme weather is a fact of life in Australia. I think we would all appreciate that. We we often think of these events as anomalies, but the reality is they are a completely natural part of every year. For example, last year there were 34 different extreme weather events that qualified as natural disasters for the purposes of Australian government assistance and 157 different local government areas that were disaster declared, many of them more than once. And it wasn't considered a particularly busy or difficult season. It's really important when we think about our risk exposure to understand that extreme weather only creates a disaster when it actually impacts on our populations, on our people and on our infrastructure and the things we value. So in that context, our risk exposure is as much a consequence of changing demographics, of uh, increasing um, sustained economic growth as it is of the actual hazard for extreme weather and climate change. And many of the factors that actually go to our vulnerability are pretty reliably predicted. When we think about demographic changes, we know that a third of our population lives outside of major city areas in the regional and peri-urban fringe areas that are most exposed to more frequent and extreme weather events. And within those, the most... Um, the biggest areas of growth, if you like, are the coastal areas that are prone to flooding and storm damage that creates the greatest economic impact. Um, when we think of um, economic growth, the last two decades have seen huge increases in asset values. The median house of a pri uh, the median price, at least, of a house in Brisbane, has risen from about 150,000 to about 450,000 since 1994. So, whichever way you cut it, our risk exposure is increasing, and yet our populations are largely unaware of the risk that they face. Those that are aware do extremely little to prepare and we see very limited investment in disaster risk reduction when we compare it to the enormous pool of funding that goes to recovery. When we talk about disaster resilience, we're really talking about effective risk management. And effective risk management is enormously reliant on reliable and accessible information about the hazards and the risks. We call it information asymmetry when different decision makers, different parts of the population, have different levels of access to information. If we take flood risk, for example, the principal collectors of that information are local governments and they readily make that risk information available to the insurance industry and they use it to inform premiums which are one of our principal signals of risk. But that information isn't necessarily made available to the public, it's not necessarily made available to other levels of government with local governments citing a whole range of barriers, um, resource implications, the um, potential IP restrictions around flood mapping, for example, or um, the risk of litigation, of liability if they make the information public. So different states are working at different paces to address these issues, but to think that the answer solely lies in the provision of risk information is probably a bit simplistic. Now, in lots of other sectors, we understand that behaviour doesn't necessarily flow from increased awareness. You know, that's particularly evident in the health sector, um, but it spans across the disaster resilience space. A lot of what we're talking about here is going to require sustained activity over a long period of time, generational change, and the development of completely new market signals that influence behaviour. When we think about roles and responsibilities in this space, we're operating in a pretty complex environment. Under our constitution, states and territories have primary responsibility for the protection of life and property in their jurisdiction, and that translates to a responsibility for uh, emergency management. Local governments are a body of the state. 
Um, they are more connected to communities who are so absolutely integral to effective response and recovery, um, certainly more connected to communities than in any other level of government. And they hold a lot of the levers around land use planning that has such a huge impact on the creation or mitigation of risk. No, the whole point of a federation is that there's strength in numbers and that's where the Commonwealth Government comes in. You know, we provide a financial safety net for the states and territories when they experience an accumulation of events that impacts on their economic sustainability. That's what our natural disaster relief and recovery arrangements are all about. The Commonwealth also provides a really important point of operational coordination, both domestically and internationally, and we have a role in aid funding, uh, building capability, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region. We have some really effective governance structures that underpin uh, our ability to develop national policy and that drive implementation of the National Strategy for Disaster Resilience that Richard referred to. But there is a real danger, I think, that we're so often preaching to the converted. You know, here we all are, sitting in a room, many of the same faces, all nodding our heads in furious agreement around the problems that we face and the broad objectives. Now, much of the transformation that we need to achieve really requires us getting outside of the emergency management space and outside of those traditional fields associated with response and recovery and gaining commitment from those other policy areas. Now, the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC plays an incredibly important role in that regard. They connect across sectors and they force governments to think outside of their traditional um, divisions around policy development. Businesses and NGOs are also hugely important and I won't speak to NGOs in any great detail because I'm sure Andrew will talk to vulnerabilities in that sector that's so incredibly reliant on volunteers. Um, when we think of private sector engagement, the majority of Australia's critical infrastructure is owned and operated by the private sector. We have some quite effective uh, governance structures that enable information sharing across those sectors, the trusted information sharing uh, network, uh, people refer to it as TISM, that facilitates information sharing and allows those critical infrastructure owners to develop strategies to build resilience of their own organisations um, and also creates an environment where they can think about hardening their supply chains. But there is a huge opportunity, I think, to actually think about engagement with industry more broadly and the capabilities that industry can bring to bear. You know, so often governments are reinventing the wheel. Why do we send defence assets halfway up the country and five minutes before they get to where they're going, they drive past a commercial road crew with all the same kit? Now, why do we build a recovery centre two doors down from a vacant motel that's suffering from a downturn in tourism? You know, there are some really practical logistical challenges, not least of which is connecting bureaucrats like me with the outside world. They let me out occasionally. Um, but there's also some real complexity there around liability and around compensation and how we manage all of that. I don't think there's any question that the greatest challenge we face in building disaster resilience goes to the limited amount of funding that goes to disaster risk reduction. Since 2009, the Commonwealth Government's invested over $12 billion in recompense to states and territories for their disaster costs under those safety net arrangements that I referred to earlier. In contrast, over the same period, we've seen about $450 million go to disaster risk reduction. The safety net is hugely important. I can't underestimate that and it's completely <coughs> sensible when you think about our constitutional roles and responsibilities that that is where the majority of the Commonwealth's attention would lie. But we know that our system was never really designed with the kind of costs um, that we're experiencing today and the arrangements are actually operating as a disincentive for other levels of government to manage their risks. You know, partner that with the challenges of just investing in prevention. 
uh, Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, um, there's a great quote from him around all of this. And to paraphrase it, he says that investing in a culture of prevention isn't easy. While the costs of prevention have to be paid in the present, the benefits lie in a distant future and moreover they're not tangible benefits. They're effectively disasters that didn't happen. You know, it's much easier for governments, it's much easier for society more broadly to invest in the things that are tangible, that are broken, that they can see right in front of them than investing in potential future risk. You know, the Productivity Commission's just undertaken a hugely comprehensive review of these national arrangements. Um, they've made their draft report and recommendations uh, last month. They're about to um, hold public hearings. They're accepting supplementary submissions. And they've made some pretty big recommendations that would see quite significant reform. They're recommending a Commonwealth Mitigation Fund. They're recommending changes to the arrangements that would see the states and territories have much more autonomy for actually directing the funding that the Commonwealth provides to the risks that are relevant to their local communities. And um, they're talking about a reduction in Commonwealth reimbursement to the states that's more commensurate with a safety net arrangement. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, but there is a huge opportunity for reform here. So look, just before I wrap up, I just wanted to flag that, you know, while there's lots of unique characteristics of the Australian environment, you know, our, our weather, our landscape, the challenges associated with disaster risk reduction are not ours alone by any means. Most of the topics that I've touched to and that I imagine we're all involved in are the subject of countries' deliberations when they develop the successor framework to the HIOGO framework for disaster risk reduction that's going to be settled in Japan next year. You know, one of our great assets, both domestically and internationally, is that we're actually largely on the same page about the problems and we're largely on the same page around the objectives. The real work to be done is in designing solutions and implementing them. And while there's a pretty long road to go there, that's not actually a bad place to be. Thanks very much.